from this distant vantage point, the earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. There's something more. There's a set of less tangible arguments many of which I freely admit I find attractive and resonant. Spaceflight speaks to something deep inside us, many of us, if not all. An emerging cosmic perspective, an improved understanding of our place in the universe, a highly visible program affecting our view of ourselves, might clarify the fragility of our planetary environment and the common peril and responsibility of all the nations and peoples of Earth. And human missions to Mars would provide hopeful prospects, rich in adventure, for the wanderers among us, especially the young. Even vicarious exploration has social utility. Projects that are future-oriented, that, despite their political difficulties, can be completed only in some distant decade, are continuing reminders that there will be a future. Winning a foothold on other worlds whispers in our ears that we're more than Picts or Serbs or Tongans. We're humans. Exploratory spaceflight puts scientific ideas, 
scientific thinking, and scientific vocabulary in the public eye. It elevates the general level of intellectual inquiry. The idea that we've now understood something never grasped by anybody who ever lived before. That exhilaration, especially intense for the scientists involved, but perceptible to nearly everybody, propagates through the society, bounces off walls, and comes back at us. It encourages us to address problems in other fields that have also never been solved. It increases the general sense of optimism in the society. It gives currency to critical thinking of the sort urgently needed if we're going to solve hitherto intractable social issues. It helps stimulate a new generation of scientists. The more science in the media, especially if methods are described as well as conclusions and implications, the healthier, I believe, the society is. People everywhere hunger to understand. I had ambition not only to go farther than anyone had done before, wrote Captain James Cook, the 18th century explorer of the Pacific, but as far as it was possible for man to go. Two centuries later, Yuri Romanenko, on returning to Earth, after what was then the longest spaceflight in history, said, quote, The cosmos is a magnet. Once you've been there, all you can think of is how to get back. Even Jean-Jacques Rousseau, no enthusiast of technology, felt it. He said, The stars are far above us. We need preliminary instruction, instruments and machines, which are like so many immense ladders, enabling us to approach them and bring them within our grasp. The philosopher Bertrand Russell, in 1959, wrote as follows. The future possibilities of space travel, which are now left mainly to unfounded fantasy, could be more soberly treated without ceasing to be interesting and could show to even the most adventurous of the young that a world without war need not be a world without adventurous and hazardous glory. To this kind of contest, there is no limit. Each victory is only a prelude to another, and no boundaries can be set to rational hope. Russell's phrase is, is noteworthy, adventurous and hazardous glory. Even if we could make human spaceflight risk-free, and of course we can't, it might be counterproductive. The hazard is an inseparable component of the glory. In the long run, these, more than any of the practical justifications considered earlier, may be the reasons we will go to Mars and other worlds. In the meantime, the most important step we can take toward Mars is to make significant progress on Earth. Even modest improvements in the social, economic, and political problems that our global civilization now faces could release enormous resources, both material and human, for other goals. There's plenty of housework to be done down here on Earth, and our commitment to it must be steadfast. But we're the kind of species that needs a frontier for fundamental biological reasons. Every time humanity stretches itself and turns a new corner, it receives a jolt of productive vitality that can carry it for centuries. There's a new world next door, and we know how to get there.